One of y'all see when we're live? It says meeting is now streaming live on Facebook. It is live on the book of face. <laughs> All right, everybody, we are live. And um, it's been one of those days, everybody, but welcome to Ghost Education 101. And as you can see by the people on the screen that our panel has changed a bit today. <laughs> Some of our original panelists um, had to unfortunately not be able to attend with us. So some great people have volunteered. It's gonna be a great, great, great panel. So thanks for joining us. So um, we're just gonna do a paranormal round table and talk all kinds of stuff paranormal. And, and I'm gonna go ahead and introduce everybody. Um, Lisa is one of our educators. Um, as a former librarian herself, she started the blog, thehauntedlibrarian.com, which has been awarded. You, you're like one of the top mm -hmm. yeah, you know, ones out there. I mean, it's amazing. Her, her website is beautiful. You should ever, I'll check it out. But she shares um, her research on various investigations. Um, she likes to connect the past with the present. And there's a lot of historical research that she puts on her on her um, website, and it's just beautiful. I just love your website. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and we have my favorite paranormal couple. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's us. Um, Mr. Ron yeah. Nakavetti. So, Ron is a former MMA. Is that how it is? MMA. Yeah commentator that's how we met when I was a prize fighter back in the day <laughs> right <laughs> um, you've been an investigator for a long time what 14 years you started in LA when you lived there you were yeah. investigating there you investigated some amazing places like the Queen Mary the Omen House Shanley Hotel Whitehall Mansion I mean that's just a drop in the bucket so that's amazing but your specialty, what you really love is ITC. And that's kind of how we met in an ITC group. So we'll get more into that later. Yes. And Miss Lourdes, his soon to be fiance. <laughs> Philip is marrying us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, y'all are going to be engaged before I'm done with it. So. <laughs> but um, when did you two meet and start investigating together? 2016 is uh, when we met and started investigating together. Yeah. You're a big ITC fan too, right? I do. I love ITC. Yep. And you two have been working on um, direct radio voice, which we'll get you to talk about that a little later. Yeah. So that stuff's really cool. I it don't is. do a lot of that yet. But. And then last minute, we had a wonderful addition, Matt Haas, who um has the strange oddities podcast yep which um is about thinking outside the box which you know we're all outside that box. We, we all tore that box up a long time ago so that's right <laughs> up my alley this is true investigating for gosh whatever 25 years yeah almost 25 years and you and you've interviewed some really top people in the paranormal field um uh, there's there's so many here you know, from Chip Coffee on, you discuss um, cryptozoology, conspiracy theories, which I love. I love a good conspiracy theory. And I want to talk to you about one about UFOs I just read lately about the Roswell crash. Okay. So this, let's just get started. Um, we'll go to ladies first. Lisa, you yes. had your first paranormal experience at Sid 3 mm -hmm. in um, Nevada. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes. So, um, of course, I don't really remember it. My parents retold the story uh, as I was growing up. My parents were believers. And um, my father was a real estate developer and was sent out to Reno to develop this, I guess, subdivision back in the 70s. It would, um, early 70s. It, I don't know if they were calling them subdivisions back then, but properties and, and housing communities. And so we were living in a townhouse and we had parquet floors in the first floor, bedrooms were upstairs and my parents had um, an extensive art collection. And so they would dedicate one, one wall to artwork and kind of set it up like as a gallery. 
And um, we had to go back to Florida. We're from Florida for something. And my dad had a friend who stayed at the townhouse to watch the pets. And um, he um, slept in one of the bedrooms upstairs, but he was awoken in the middle of the night hearing paintings falling and footsteps on the parquet floor. And so he, um, you know, back in the early 70s, we didn't have cell phones. So it was long distance phone call. And he's like, Joe, something's going on in your house and I'm sleeping on your couch. And so he wouldn't go upstairs or any um, or onto the landing of the stairs. And so my parents um, would tell the story as I was growing up that when we lived there, um, I would have been three and I have a sister who's 13 months younger. And my mom, um, a prolific, I was a prolific sleepwalker up until um, my adult age. And they would find me all the time, like walking around. And I would be, one instance, I was sitting on the landing of the stairs and talking to somebody and just carrying on a conversation. You know, we were playing and it was, you know, just kind of what you see in movies. And my mom was, um, came down and she's like, Lisa, who are you talking to? What's going on? And, and I'm like, this is my friend. And we're just, yeah, right. You don't see her. I mean, I see her. And then I had a wicker rocking chair in my bedroom and it would rock all the time. And my parents would come in and um, they, you know, they would see it rocking and I would be talking to somebody and they're like, who are you talking to? And I'm like, my friend, you don't see her. <laughs> and um and what's interesting is my father thought it was a poltergeist and back then you know resources on paranormal you had to be in a large city or at in a, a place with metaphysical bookstores and so forth and so there wasn't a lot out there so he thought it was a poltergeist and it was um near indian mounds and and sacred land and everything and he thought in the wisdom of my father, who was never met a stranger, he was a talk show host, lobbyist, real estate um, broker, realtor. And um, he thought that if we moved back to Florida, that if we passed over water, oh, then yeah. the poltergeist couldn't join us. Yeah. <laughs> not thinking that Florida was an island, maybe, I don't know. And so um, we moved back to Florida and um, the activity, and I, I think the friend or, or either followed and in these instances, I do remember, I do remember we stayed um, in a, um, um, a short-term housing before we bought our house and looking out the window and, and, and having conversations and waking up talking. And then when we moved to our um, house that I grew up in, our one dog, um, Poppy, she would bark in the corner. And, and my dad would be like, I thought we left the poltergeist in Reno. <laughs> um, so, um, <laughs> and, so was, doesn't work. <laughs> and um, but apparently we didn't. And so that but I know I remember from age eight kindergarten onward but apparently my earliest experience was at age three wow yeah you know, and when we start talking about the um, sleepwalking you know if today if we would hear a client giving that as part of the activity we'd say well we got to check the emf in the house see if you've got really high emf causing you to sleepwalk or something so mm -hmm. but your friend followed you so that doesn't really yeah just made that all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the, my couple as you can answer together. But Lourdes, what got you interested in the paranormal? Well, I was always interested in the paranormal because I had paranormal experiences too at a young age, right? I used to have a lot of um, premonition dreams, and my mom, you know, we would talk about it and stuff like that. But I don't consider that one of my first paranormal experiences. My, one of my first paranormal experiences I experienced was. Um, every time I talk about it was um my um we was in my aunt's house and there was a party going on and I saw a spirit jump from my cousin into my mom Ooh. and when I saw that she started yeah. it was me and my brother and when I saw that I knew it wasn't my mom because she was moving in ways that I know my mom doesn't move you know what I mean so that was very traumatic for me and I was um it made me not scared, but I, I, I aware. And yeah. then 
I didn't um, investigate or anything like that, but I was always interested. And then I met Ron and then he was into the paranormal stuff and then it clicked and then we started. I was like, this is awesome, you know? Cause I always did want to do it, but I just did it, you know? Yeah. 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 And, and Ron. she, she um, also by trade, um, if people haven't seen us or don't know us before, she's a court reporter too. So when you get to the review of evidence part, um, even for the spirit world, good luck speaking and not having her hear it. <laughs> she's, really, she's got a great ear for it. A lot of times she oh, hears wow, things that are, that are lower and the clarity and the enunciation is there, but it's just not as easy to pick up. Um, so I started, I'm about a, a decade, not quite 14 years, but I started in LA. Um, I started with the, the, at the Queen Mary, uh, David Oman's house, like you mentioned, uh, Glenn Tavern Inn. Um, El Pico house. So there's a lot of places down there that were really, really, really fascinating. And it started because I was always into this stuff. Also, I was friends back in the day. I did stand up comedy for a number of years. And I was friends with a gentleman who in comedy went by the name Peter Jordan. No, Peter Young, J-U-N-G, like Carl Young. He took yeah. Young, and it, but he was a UFO uh, investigator and a parapsychologist. And he was Peter Jordan in that realm. He never mixed the two. Um, mm -hmm. But when he spoke, he was so interesting to listen to, and he was so knowledgeable and fun that it was almost like just finished the connection. I mean, you're, you've got all that stuff going on. He was great. Um, so I was exposed to it back then. I was always a fan of that stuff when there was, like Lisa was saying, there was almost nothing on TV or resource-wise or anything back then. And flash forward, and when I'm in LA, I got separated and divorced, and, and I was seeing somebody, and we did not, out of 7,000 cable channels, we did not agree on one thing to watch <laughs> except <laughs> ghost adventures uh, and then uh got i got started going to a lot of the places they had been that season were were local to southern california oh yeah so like pico house and stuff like downtown la and so we started going to places and um the first time somebody thought they heard something with amplified listening on an evp and then played back the thing we all heard it i was like whoa wait wait what was that how did where do I get one of those? I was in. I was in. Um, you know, like we all know that the, the you know you can go on a million investigations. You don't always get class A. You don't always get anything sometimes. But you know, you fall into what I think is a healthier version of the gambler's mentality. When you're you're going to play against the house, you know, sooner or later, yeah, it's coming again. It's, <laughs> <laughs> your numbers are coming up it's coming so you keep doing it you keep trying and it's and it's uh it's the thrill of the chase and it's the thrill of uh for me uh, education i love learning there's there's i know tons more than i did last year or the year before there's tons of stuff i don't know and that's that's the stuff that keeps me going forward i mean there's things we'll never know until we get on the other side and come back to haunt people i mean <laughs> just, yeah that's true too and, and i'm I coming back to haunt people doing that yeah. <laughs> yeah there's a lot of people on my list i want to haunt Oh, yeah. <laughs> Their clocks are always going to be behind. I'm always going to make them late. Yeah. All the non-believers. <laughs> we now, we now oh, know yeah. they can't lose us if they go over water. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I got a boat. No, I don't really have a boat. <laughs> <laughs> Investigating for 25 years. You must have been like two when you started. I mean, right? I got you into <laughs> uh, No, I started right out of high school. Um you know, basically right out, right out, right out of high school. I would, I graduated in the mid nineties. And so like, I would say between 96, 97, I started investigating and uh, I just would always investigate on my own. I was always curious, read books when I was younger, you know, I took books out of the library in school about UFOs and Bigfoot lake monsters and anything metaphysical I would be into reading and the librarian would look at me like as if I had 20 heads you know she'd be like what the hell are you reading you're getting into at your age you know and uh but yeah I had um you know always been interested since I was a young kid and um I had my first paranormal experience uh just out of high school where I had a bad car accident and I it just pushed me to further question what's going on and I just was hooked ever since, and I've been doing it ever since. Uh, are you on a team? Do you have a team now, or do you do it on your own? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm 
like we had teams over the years. Um, we just kind of growing into just kind of networking now with a lot of people. We, we have more fun kind of uh, moonlighting with other investigators that are like-minded and, yeah. you know, have the same goals and passion as we do and have fun and, you know, uh, you know, all the things that they're into, we're into. So, um, but I still investigate and help people from time to time, whenever that we get a call, I'll help somebody out. You know, I, I don't want to leave a family hanging if they need help. So, no. Um, Lisa, tell me about your most memorable paranormal experience, even if it was scary, not scary. What's the one that just will always be the one that you think of when someone asks you, what, what changed your world? Um, we were on an investigation and um, so I, I like what um, Matt was saying about moonlighting because I, w I was on a, um, I, I did co-found a group, Archer Paranormal Investigations, and, and, and having a group is a lot of work. I mean, it, it's like a full-time job, and hmm. it, it's kind of exhausting in a way, um, yeah. sometimes not get, taking a break and everything, um, and so I like, I, I'm going to, I like moonlighting, but um, we were going out, and, and it was one of our early investigations, and by then I had, like I had um, seen pictures of things, but I had never had anybody um, or anything come into my personal space. And um, and listening to EVPs and be like, oh, that's cool, you know, and, and seeing images. But we were um, up in Rome, Georgia, yeah. which is um, part of Trail of Tears. And so when people think of Atlanta area in Hauntings, they kind of initially or immediately think of civil war because we do have a lot of civil war hauntings. We, we had a lot of tragedy. In fact, my neighborhood um, had one of the one of the bloodiest battles before they marched into Atlanta because I'm in Marietta and um, they accidentally burned down the city. They didn't or town. They didn't really mean to. But um, they always one question, though, for yeah. people listening that don't know what the Trail of Tears are, can you just briefly say what it is? I mean, I know what it is, but yeah, uh, um, the Trail of Tears mm -hmm. is the when the U.S. government came in and relocated Native American tribes out west. They wanted the land and they moved them, and they didn't move them in a good way. They um, they forced walked them, marched them, frog marched them um, across, and from Georgia they went up north. They were March north and then west instead of you know it, it was horrible horrible. Um, some instances. No. no, not at all. Um, majority of Native Americans died mm -hmm. um, from that, and um, it was forceful relocation. And uh, and so and it's interesting because um, in Atlanta we're North Georgia. And so some people kind of have a disconnect of Native American Indian tribes kind of being part of the Trail of Tears because it's a presumption that it was more like Pennsylvania um, westward and it was south, like Florida up and out. And so this was um, up in Rome, Georgia, we have the Etowah Indian mounds, um, these beautiful Indian mounds that are protected. And so a lot of Native American activity. And so, and this was um, like, um, equivalent to Section 8 housing. We don't have in the United States Section 8 housing anymore. Those were housing vouchers for um, low income family to have housing. And so now you get um, supplement for getting into apartments. So this was an old Section, out, section 8 housing complex. So it, it saw a lot of tragedy through Native American Civil War and then just low income families. And um, we went at this investigation at this apartment and um, we, we were doing the investigation. It's small, two bedroom, one bath, little living room, little kitchen. And I'm standing there and I'm, I'm in charge of the cameras. And so I'm just filming everything as um, we're doing the interviews and talking and just it, trying to make contact. And um, the bottom, my right leg, I had jeans on because it was um, winter time in Georgia, which is jeans and like an outer coat, right? Um, and I had this hard tug on my jean leg down. A and I was like, what was that? Because I've, I've, I've never been touched 
you know, probably have been touched, but not to the extent I was tugged. And, um, and it was interesting because I'm like, holy crap. But it was funny because I wasn't like, oh my God, I'm scared. I was like, that was awesome. <laughs> Can you do it again? Um, and no, I didn't get it again. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you hate that? I did, you know, I was, but you know, it, it was, you know, once was enough, right? It was just the, the tug of love, I guess. That, that will change your whole outlook on paranormal life from then on. Like when I got hit in that school, it's like totally mm -hmm. changed everything. But you know, that tiny apartment, this just goes to show you, it doesn't have to be a big, scary haunted mansion. It can be a little apartment. Yeah. So you always have to be prepared and not presume because the location right. is well, tiny I, in a small apartment that it can't be absolutely horrifying. Of course. Absolutely. And, and if you're looking at this from the meta science side of it, right, where yeah. we suggest that this is another realm or dimension or alternate universe or plane or whatever it is, if it's not within our physical space, if it's not bound by time space laws that we supposedly are, mm -hmm. then, then the, whatever they're occupying that's that's interplaning with what we are is not bound by the one bedroom apartment that you perceive everything to exist in. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's part of the issue too, even with really fine matter, right? We look at the wall over there and we don't see anything between us and the wall. So we assume that it's just empty space. But in, in reality, there's radio waves going through there that we can't see. That's energy. We're energy. So there's, there's things that are not visible that can be at play and it's not bound by the same space time or even physical matter laws that we apply to it. And that can happen anywhere. <laughs> yeah. it, if I can add to that, uh, guys, if you don't okay. mind, um, well, one of the things that I enjoy working with people like Ron and Lourdes is like when we do, uh, for example, I don't know if you guys are into spirit boxes and all the devices ATC uses. Um, yeah, but, but uh if you you can basically use it anywhere and get some kind of communication with them it, it doesn't necessarily have to be in a haunted location and you can try to get communication and validate that you're communi communicating with something intelligently because that response was relevant to your question or your actions going on at that moment so it doesn't necessarily have to be an old historic location you know i feel spirits aren't bound just to a single location that's a great point. There actually yep. are, are earlier paranormal authors and researchers who would even suggest that vocals from the realm of spirit is not enough to categorize a location as haunted because of that very fact you can attain them anywhere. Mm -hmm. So for a location to be under the umbrella of haunted, it's got to have more benchmarks than just vocal responses or EVP. It's like a medium could connect with your loved one here at my house and then go to your house, connect with the same loved one. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. they're, they're in the vibration of the planet. I mean, they're just everywhere. Right. Um, Matt, what's the scariest thing that ever happened to you on an investigation? Oh boy. Um, I had a few. Uh, Tell us. <laughs> I, I remember one uh, in particular, because in a way it's kind of funny because I don't, normally uh react in a situation like this um we were in a place in jersey uh ron knows this place uh freeling heist and mansion okay. in Mar morristown new jersey mm -hmm. and we we're on the third floor which was known as the servants quarters that's where they all the servants of the people that lived there originally uh would stay and sleep and that that's where they're you know stayed overnight there um but we were on the third floor and we were on two ends of the hallway, the long hallway on the third floor that connect to all the rooms. And I was on one end, my wife and another investigator on another, another end. And I had things happening kind of all around me. I was laying on the floor with my back turned to the rooms where stuff was happening. And I didn't like the fact that there was stuff going on behind me looking to come at me. And I didn't know what was there because I couldn't see and it was dark and I just like froze because there was so much stuff going on at once. And I got so emotional and like, not that I was scared or anything, but it was startling to see how much activity was going on around me. And I didn't know what to do with that because I just like froze. Cause I didn't have anything to that like 
intensity happen all at once. And my wife had to come and get me. I was like, can you help me up off the floor? I can't move. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I was just frozen. That was the only time I ever froze like that. <coughs> Bless you. Bless you. <laughs> Did anybody hear anything weird just a few seconds ago? I saw you reacting to something, yeah. I heard Ron sneeze. I want to <laughs> check around 9.20ish p.m. the audio on that. I swear, I just heard a growl. Hmm. Oh, wow. Boy. I have to review that. It wasn't my stomach, I swear. Oh, so it's yeah. like... Yeah, we all ate. <laughs> weird things happen on this. We got a great EVP um, when Bishop Long was on during our <laughs> interview with him. A little girl was like, help me. And I'm like... Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Anything's possible, especially with ITC people. You know, they're like, "Oh, they're on. Let's talk to them." So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they and in even an earlier ITC experimentation, right? They've come through with clarity on computers, fax machines, answering machines, radios. It's yeah. it's filming movies. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Talking about connecting with spirit anywhere with the spirit boxes. You know, this the ITC was not meant. For the paranormal it was developed for communicating with your loved ones when you look at bocce and george me it was more of a connecting to the other side the higher other side not the ghost that's murdered in the basement so a lot of people think you know it's just they just see it on television and that there's so much more to itc i would just recommend everybody researching you know, we're trying to get an ITC presentation on with the history of ITC. But, um, <clears throat> Marcello, ba Marcello Bocci is the heavyweight champion. Oh my God, he's of awesome. ITC, as far as I'm concerned. He's gotten in one sitting stuff that is unmatchable by anything I've ever seen on a paranormal TV show. Just complete real time communication through a vacuum tube radio. And, and those European researchers have been vetted at levels beyond having somebody throw scorn at them on a website or a social media platform. They, they well, had, they took the tubes out of his radio. Out of the radio, unplugged tubes, the radio, tubes. pulled the radio yeah. out in the middle. Mm -hmm. And the voices still came through. Yeah. And what's amazing about that is like you said, Philip, it was, they did it to help the grieving process. Yes. You no, know, for parents who, lo who lost children or yeah. vice versa. And, it, it's a beautiful thing and then now itc you know it's also used for that but nowadays it's more for the ghost in the basement that was you know <laughs> murdered well, I, I think beheaded or something <laughs> i think the possibilities it presents for someone who's researching the afterlife and whether someone was murdered in the basement or it was a loved one of one of ours yeah. it's still technically in the same bucket mm -hmm. of being able to connect with with afterlife too yeah. you know and absolutely initially it was all considered evp and then in 1989, um, Professor Ernst Senkowski in, in Germany coined instrumental transcommunication, or over there they call it TCI, transcommunication instrumental, yeah. to categorize something where it's not just like an EVP, the device captures the voice, but it doesn't facilitate it. When you do ITC, the medium is the device. It's coming through the device. And we may be part of that as an energy source or a contributor, Absolutely. but the medium is, is the device. So that was why that term was coined, just to differentiate the two. Do you ever see the um, documentary EVP in the Vatican? Mm -mm. No. 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 I thought you were going to say Calling Earth. Which was it was on YouTube, and it must have been yanked or something. But um, it's about a priest that was recording the, the chants, you know, to preserve them. And I'm not sure who the Pope was at the time. Pope Pius the Twelfth. It was Pope Pius the Twelfth, okay. and it was a uh, Father Gemelli and uh, Ernelli. Er, no, Gemelli and Ernetti. Oh, I think. And one of them, they were yeah, they were recording. Um, it was wire recordings of, of Gregorian chants. Yes. And one of their fathers spoke to them on the recording. Exactly. As an EVP, and they brought it to the Pope. To the and Pope. They, right. They were going to be called sinners and blaspheme or else because of that you know. What, wasn't that called yeah. the Vatican tapes? Right, could have been uh, the one I saw was the EVP in the Vatican, but I mean, it yeah, could be other tapes. things, but yeah, if anybody can find that. I Porn tapes, <laughs> I would love yeah. to see that. That's funny, yeah. <laughs> but the, Pope said that the Pope said from this, You shall not talk to the dead, 
Well, that specific Pope told them that they were not accountable as sinners for that because that was not what they were intending to do. And that since the machine facilitated the grab or the communique, so to speak, that they were not doing anything wrongful. They were recording chants. They didn't know it was happening. It wasn't their intent. They were not being sinful. Yeah, yeah. Two Hail Marys and go. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, interesting is the Pope didn't deny that to, that it happened, who no. it was, because mm. he knew this this priest's father, apparently. He knew the voice. Right. Yeah, and he thought that this would also help bolster the belief in, in you know, going to heaven or yeah. an afterlife, so. Well, heaven and hell, with, as far as the Pope's concerned, probably, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's right? it. That whole mindset too, that all dates back much, much further too. There's, a, there's this idea that, that science and, and the mystical or the supernatural paranormal stuff is two separate paths, but it really is not. This was like from, was it was 1545 to 63, I think it was uh, called the Council of Trent in Trento, Italy. Big ecumenical gathering, all the Catholic Church. It was a Reformation Act, an anti-Protestant Reformation Act as a reaction to what the Protestants had going on and they um they basically to kind of trim it down summed up all, right, all this stuff that has to do with the the physical and measuring things and you know weight and girth but that's all science that's all you and everything that has to do with you know the spirits and oh that's us the church yeah. done yeah and so those things were separated but that's that's how that happened it's really not the more we dive into this it's not really two different things at all there really is so much to do with scientific yeah support yeah. for, what, for what we do and then didn't that era uh kind of kick start uh the enlightenment era if i'm if i'm not mistaken i think so yeah mm -hmm. it just popped champagne no. <laughs> did you hear that yeah that's what it sounded I did like i hear that i did no, hear that that was me oh <laughs> okay i was like that was not popping champagne yeah. <laughs> without us yeah um, Matt, what our own enlightenment era? <laughs> that was validation. Uh, Matt, what's your favorite piece of um, investigation equipment? Um, you know, I I love all the gadgets and everything, and I love where everything's going as far as how it's advancing and everything. I love the spirit boxes; they're one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. I would say out of everything, but believe it or not, I've been trying to tune in more into my own abilities and my own senses and try to feel around me yes. more and listen more to see what I can hear more with my own ears. I'm trying to get more in tune with the spirits as far as just sitting there and, and listening and learning, yeah. you know, how I can communicate uh, intuitively. <laughs> Talk to your spirit guides about helping you do that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, say, you know, let me feel the energy from my left. Let me feel it from my right. You know, you, there's a little, exercises you can do yeah my woo -woo, but my mentor is always telling me that you know you got you got to meditate more you got to you know train mm -hmm. yourself more with that and communicate yeah. more with my spirit guys because they're all, always trying to communicate with her and she's like no you got to start communicating with them <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> meditating is like the best i love meditating it's yeah. just so oh I meditating others said medicating because oh, no, <laughs> i can do that too i have a lot of that in my cabinet yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've actually, we've actually bear witness to both Matt uh, at a couple instances because we've gotten to investigate with him before. And the one time um, we always forget where we were. We were on location somewhere and Philip remoted in. Oh, yeah. And he was nailing stuff that yeah. was happening in the location. We were that getting was, stuff yeah. out of the boxes after he said it. Yep. I loved uh, it. That's not really remote viewing. Remote viewing is like not see, you know, but, but can, uh, communicating with spirits through the video i love doing that if i can watch where you're at and see the area yeah i love doing that and i've done that for a lot of other teens i just saturday night i was helping somebody like can you tell me what's going on here and i said well which is the woman that sews and I'm like oh i don't know hold on a minute and they said yeah it's that woman she sews and i said watch out for her she's she's the one doing something that she shouldn't be doing Want to find out yeah they've been dabbling with the tarot cards and some other stuff but anyway but that's fine <laughs> so yeah. Lisa, what's your favorite piece of equipment who is that me yeah oh sorry <laughs> i'm like i because I, I i'm like tarot cards wow um <laughs> i don't you know honestly i 
I'm, I can't hear anything, um, or I can, but it, I mean, I can hear obviously, but um, I'm not good at listening to the tapes and the audio. I just can't hear it. Um, and it's kind of like on shows, like I was binging Holzer Files last night and they were playing something and I was like, I didn't hear anything. <laughs> um, so it, it's, it's how, and I'm kind of thinking, what is my favorite one? Because I, I like taking the pictures and going through the pictures. I, and um and I, and um, I don't catch a lot of it. Uh, and I think that's what I like about it is just getting rid of filtering through things and going, nope, 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 nope. Ooh, this might be something. Nope, nope. And, um, and it's so simple. And I, but I like also comparing my cell phone pictures to the digital camera pictures. And, and seeing differences. And I think that just has, um, because it's old, it feels old school and I like that. And because I just, I, I don't hear things when we do that. Now, um, I, I don't have the, the luxury of having a Frank's box and my friend hasn't taken me out to see how his is working. But <laughs> You've got your vaccinations. I get my first one Friday and then you can come on over. Yeah, I know. Then we're safe, right? Um, but I will say um, some, something that gets a lot of trash talk are, is the app, the ghost apps on your phone. And I have a good story on that. Um, um, so we did an investigation and we were over in uh, Lawrenceville. And which is a, in a, the metropolitan Atlanta area is comprised of five counties, like right here, but it, it can be encompass up to 26 counties, depending on who, who you talk to, because it, um, Georgia has a lot of counties for a state. And so this is a metropolitan, a, a, a suburb of Atlanta. And it was an older home in terms of, we don't have like old, old homes like Jersey and New York, but um, so 1950s um, home built and um, just a nice middle-class neighborhood. And um, the owners of the home leased the home out to one of their ch um, children, the son and a couple of his friends live there, adult children. And the parents were very fascinated about the activity because when they lived there, they had activity. So they were actually there for the initial, um, when we first got there before we did the investigation and they were renovating the house. And so the front door was moved to the dining room because um, it was more like a um, shotgun style in a way, in a weird way. But um, so when you came, came through, the China cabinet was right at the front door and their dining room table. And um, they're sitting at the dining room table and um, started the ghost app immediately when we walked in and, it, and it's just running in. And I'm, I'm not the, um, I'm not, I wasn't the team psychic. I wasn't, um, I, I was the person, I, I did the research because I love research. So I'm just taking notes and listening and, and occasionally looking at the words that are coming up. And so the woman, older woman was talking and I'm fascinated by her China cabinet because I'm nosy. So I, I'm like looking at the China cabinet and there was, there was a strange object in there and I can't honestly remember what it was. But I was, I was drawn to it, like, oh, what's that? And then out of my mind, and, and then taking notes and keeping up and paying attention. And I look at the, the ghost app, and it said Talmadge. And I'm not from Georgia. I'm from Florida. And Talmadge isn't a word I kn uh, know at all. And it's not a, a word that's in my vernacular and used around. And I'm like, what's, what's Talmadge? And the woman goes, you mean Governor Talmadge? <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Um, she's like, yeah, my dad um, back in the day worked for Governor Talmadge and this piece in the China cabinet, um, she told me, explain what it was and said that he, that was a gift from the governor to my dad that's been passed down to me that's now sitting in the China cabinet. And I was like, okay, that's a pretty cool story. Yeah. So, yeah. So before, so whenever I see on boards and discussions about the ghost app, I'm like, yeah, I got a good story. Yeah. So yeah. don't just immediately discount it. That's no, right. No, that's right. Timing and relevance is what governs every capture we do with EVP or ITC. Timing and relevance. You have both of those nailed down. Uh, yeah. Second of all, you tell an awesome story. <laughs> she really yeah. does. Yeah. Like, I, I was hoping it was longer, but go on. <laughs> oh, you're so sweet. Thank you. That was really cool. 
And, and the spirit and, wants to communicate. They're going yeah. to communicate. They're using, you know, modern technology. They're adapting as we're adapting. Mm -hmm. Right. So they're coming through electronic an app. It's like, oh, look, look what we can do. The problem, right. the problem is, is that when when people don't understand something fully how it works or how yeah. it could work, they immediately just knock it and debunk it because it could be false. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. guess what? By definition, anything being of a scientific nature has to be falsifiable. If the process you're using cannot be falsified, the process is not by nature scientific. You have to be able to do that. That's for one. For two, there's no piece of technology in medicine, in auto mechanics. It is nothing that works 100% of the time. So they go, oh, I got this stupid app and it doesn't work. It may never work, but maybe it work for you. It may work. Mm -hmm. You don't be right. someone else. That's right. But yep. that we all have our good. different energy and our different vibrations, our different connection experiences. Yep. You know, yep. each person changes the environment. Yeah. Hence Lisa's story. Yeah. That, that, <laughs> that story is all you, that's all you need to, yeah. to say that app works. It worked one time. It mm -hmm. works. Yep. Does it always work? No. What What yeah. does? Yeah, that was designed for her too. You hear yeah. my dog snoring. It was directed snoring. to her. Papa. Okay, he's really loud snoring. Um, <laughs> Even that was the growling you heard. So, um, Ron, Lourdes, do you do um, private investigations? Do you do home investigations? I cannot, I can't remember like working Some. with clients. We have. What's your Some. most memorable client investigation? Uh, you know which one? When <laughs> Mm -hmm. so that smile come across her face it's gonna be good <laughs> my favorite investigation we did it with our friend april who's a psychic oh um, um yeah blonde yeah yeah, yeah it's a psychic right. housewife of new yes. jersey <laughs> yes so we went into a, a residential case and um in the house they were having activity um pulling of the sheets and stuff like that the husband though was getting more of the violent type kind of thing and we found out later on, well, we think, right? Because we got um, through a spirit box, we got, um, you know, where was it was her brother and why he was sticking around was because, you know, he was looking out for her. I think the brother and the husband were, didn't get along too well. Right. And, um, and, if, and we found out that he did kill himself. He committed suicide, the brother, and shot himself in the head. So... The wife also had some issues like, you know, because him, her and her brother weren't at good terms at the time when it happened. So um, we also got responses like, um, I'm sorry, everything is okay because she was worried and it brought her closure. That's and it was so, it was just a beautiful thing. Cause you know, she, she wasn't upcoming or upfront with, um, that she thought that maybe it was her brother and all these other issues, you know, surrounding it. Right. But once, you know, it came through and then she spilled the beans, I guess. Yeah. And we gave her the closure. She, it was a very emotional, you know, emotional like ending and feeling. And then, you know, she felt a lot better. So I like that because we helped the family. We helped her, you know, so. Yeah. And, yeah. and no, it, bring peace to the house and the family. Right. As we all, as we all know too, beyond a shadow of a doubt, we cannot prove who was talking to us. However, if you go by how some legal systems work with a preponderance of evidence, not a slam dunk, right? Then it would really lean in that direction. Um, and Phil, you probably have done more of these cases than Matt, maybe you as well, or at least two. Um, we haven't done a ton of the residentials, but I know Philip, you do a thorough interviewing process ahead of time. So some of the things, and this is what was really insightful about some of the things that came through the ghost box sessions prompted the woman and, and, and husband who lived in the house to tell us some of those things, the connections of stuff that happened because they came through. I guess that like led them, all, mm -hmm. you know, but so they didn't disclose everything up right. front. There were things that we didn't know. And then when things started coming out, that's, oh, that was my brother used to call me that. And that's what he said about my sister. And then all of a sudden, the details started coming mm -hmm. out so right right you know yeah. it, we can and we can interview and questionnaire you know till the cows come home it doesn't mean they're always going to give us all the information that's right 
Yeah. yeah and it's, um, it's when I was you know, with people Saturday night, I said, you're not getting all of the information from the people in the house. Mm-hmm. And they found out that they were not. Mm-hmm. And I yeah. said, you know, but, you know, it's, it, and that's what it's all about. Think how she went to bed that night with just a lighter heart, you know? Right. Right. It was, it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. It made, it made me feel, you know, good. That, that that's the reward good. in my opinion, uh, like, yeah. you know, that's as great. investigators, you know, helping people how to deal with it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. People say all the time, you mean you don't charge, you go all the way out there and do I said, no, I said, that's the payment. Mm-hmm. That, right. that, that gratitude and happiness of the client is like, that's worth, you know, a million dollars. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can't you can't charge for the and the other side of it is 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 that same substantiating part, right? Like let's say somebody calls you to the house because they have activity going on. You charge them a thousand dollars, you go in, you do your little zippity doo da whiz bang stuff, boom, activity stops. Perfect. Month and a half later, stuff kicks up again. So can you prove that you actually did it or was what you tried to get rid of before still there, or is it a different spirit or different spirits and now they're causing so you can't you're charging for a service that you can't really substantiate so you're going to take monetary gain and you can't really you know it's clear and there are no professional paranormal investigators this is not a profession you're not going to duke university and get a master's degree in being a paranormal investor i mean right yeah, that's that's a, that's very important that you bring that up. I think there's terminology that's floating around in our field mm-hmm. that the longer we use it, we keep feeding that to the people outside the field who don't know anything about it and who judge it. You know, pseudoscience is another big one for me. It's not a pseudoscience. It's not even a science, mm-hmm. right? When there's bones in the ground, people who examine and dig those up, that's an archaeologist, right? The bones are the subject matter. That's what he works on. He's the archaeology, archaeology is the science. Mm -hmm. So spirits and the other realms and what we're trying to communicate with, that's the subject matter or the evidence we get. That's what we study. So it's not a pseudo, it's not a science. The methodologies you use can or cannot be scientific. But the field itself is not a pseudo science. If you're measuring electromagnetic waves, guess what? That's scientific. Yeah. You're using frequencies to try to communicate. That's scientific. Yeah. You know, and you can't bring it into a lab is, well, yes, you can. In some instances, Baki was brought into a lab. Yeah, they yeah. shielded the radio. They've done stuff in the lab for two. And second of all, for uh, astronomers and, and, and other people who do field studies, you know, they don't tell them, well, you need to bring Saturn into the lab and otherwise, you know. Right. <laughs> we can conduct ourselves in a professional manner. Right. And be professional in what we do but we're not professionals right far from it i know i'm not (laughs) absolutely you're right so um matt what's your most memorable client-based investigation one of my most memorable investigations um like a a private home where you work with a car work with a client not not a public right um there was one um many years many years ago uh when i was a very young investigator Mm -hmm. um being brought into the field uh there was a person who uh called us in um she claims all these things she um had a lot of issues and uh was living with multiple people in the house um she had it turns out that she had other paranormal groups in the house before our group came to help her so i kind of felt like maybe she was one of these people who couldn't um, deal with uh, the people giving them the answers for her or not being able to give her the answer she was looking for. And that's why she kept looking, you know, to other people constantly. But we went in and did our thing. You know, I interviewed the lady. I said, I can't turn away people, you know, that need help. So I'll go and do our thing. Went in, did our thing. And there was really no activity that we can really pick up on with any any equipment you know any uh senses or anything nothing really happened um we gave it time and we were able to figure things out logically um you know like one of the claims was a light bulb flickering on and off and we just kind of figured 
we think it was faulty electric, you know, that house is kind of old, the electric needed upgrading. And, you know, we looked at the panel and it was a little outdated. So we said, you know, that could be contributing to the flickering of the lights, you know, stuff like that. And I, I sat down with her and I explained to her, I said, this is what's going on. And she goes, yeah, but the, all these things are going on. Then I learned, like we, what we were talking about, then the truth starts coming out after you start, you know, interacting with them more about what you're doing. And she came out saying, well, you know, I'm living with my boyfriend. I'm living with my ex-husband and a foster child. And she's got all these like serious issues going on in her personal life. And I, it, to me, it sounded like she had more... She was trying to blame everything on the paranormal and we were able to debunk a lot of it. Um, not that that was my goal, but we couldn't find anything paranormal. So I had to tell her, I don't think you need another group in here. I just think you're looking to talk to somebody about your issues. Maybe you need somebody to talk to and that's what you're looking for more than, you know, going through the paranormal stuff. And um, to me, that was one of the best private home investigations I ever did because I was able to help somebody, you know, figure out how to help themselves in their own personal life aside from the paranormal beliefs. And she was so like, thankful and emailed me and she was like I can't believe you know all the things you taught me and blah 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 and she was so grateful and you know and again, and again that was my reward to like I, I'm able to help somebody like that and to help them move forward with their lives instead of just constantly harping on stuff that wasn't even there that's beautiful right. yeah well, that that's that's a great paranormal investigator right there Thank you. Yeah. So many teams want to run in and find a demon in somebody's house, and they would not even take the time to go over all that with this client. Mm. Yeah, we've worked with Matt before. He, he's very thorough. He's very detail oriented. He, he does not rush or it should jump to the next thing he wants to do, or if something seems to be working or arousing curiosity that something might be going on, he takes his time. Um, yeah, and that's, he has a good heart, which is it counts. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. for the clients. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of why we're in this. Mm -hmm. um, somebody in the chat had an interesting question. Uh, Ronnie Huddleston. Um, has anyone here had an attachment from an investigation? Oh, <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> Mr. Ron, to see it. Um, so it, it, I'm not sure at what location it happened, and I'm not sure exactly how it happened. But a shaman who was in the group I was with in California got rid of it. I'll try to condense the story. Um, at the time, she realized there was something there. She said it was around for uh, three or four weeks, but I guess it took up uh, a little bit of time to build up some steam. Uh, around about the time that it started to realize something was going on, I had been to David Oman's house. Now, I don't think that's where I got it, but the... Uh, I think it was already there before that, but that house is uh, the geomagnetic anomaly that that house is, mm -hmm. like positive uh, 5,000 milligauss at the front door and negative at the spiral staircase. It's, it's, it's bizarre. It's, the, the USGS considers it anomalous, that piece of land, not just the house. The it's whole, coming from the earth. That yeah. 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 yeah, it's, it's, it's the down there fear cage levels. It's really, it's really um, the, the bottom floor you go down, it's disorienting sometimes. So I think that there, I think being at that house was like a was like a B12 shot for whatever I already had going on. And that's when it was able to start doing more. That's what I think. Um, woke up, I had scratches on my face. Uh, my son had cats that were not in the bedroom at the time. I had a heat dish that was uh, for fire safety. It's like a big round satellite dish kind of thing. The core heats up and then it, you know, and it would go eh, 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 like a REM pod, but nobody was touching it. Um, I had a ghost hunting app on my phone that would open up by itself and start running. Yes. <laughs> um, I was in the car and it felt like somebody was kicking my seat from the back. Um, I was driving to a location one time also during this. And this is one of those things that's a little bit of a stretch, but I don't know, but there were big bales of hay, like the bricks of hay on the back of a truck. And two of them flew off the truck and landed on the highway almost in front of my car and I had to go around it. So I started getting anxiety here, felt a little bit choked. It was like, this has got a little bit too weird. So I, I called the guy who ran the group. He called one of the women who was a shaman. She said, yes, it's been there for about a month. It's dark. It's not that powerful, but it's, it's playing with you or messing with you. 
So if you want to sage you around yourself, whatever, it'll kind of keep it at bay, but that's not going to get rid of it. This is a Thursday. She was come in Saturday, take care of it. And she did. On Friday, in between those two days, I picked up my son from his mom's house. His mom and I are not together, but still very good friends. And I go pick him up and uh, just to rule out the angst and hostility that could have been feeding it from that relationship. There wasn't anything of that. I pick him up. We're in the car and I named five things. We're going to stop at the supermarket before we go home. Five things. Let's pick these things up. I get in the supermarket. I'm glad he's too young to remember. Um, two of the items I named flew off the shelf in front of me and landed at my feet. A loaf of bread slid out from the second shelf from the top and landed in front of me when I got to the bread. And then a package of American cheese like that popped out of the bin. So it went over the little wall and hit the floor and landed at my feet. And that is not usually my shopping experience, even with coupons. And I'd love it if it was. It'd be so much easier. Right? <laughs> right? <Basket out. laughs> so I was like, that's just not. And so I went to see her yeah, Saturday. Normal. And why did you uh, cook, uh, cook grilled cheese? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Go to the soup aisle. Yeah. That, so what did the shaman do for you? Had, I laid down on this table. She did this whole ritual kind of thing. She scribed something onto a paper. It's very scribbly looking. I still have it. Um, she said, you'll know when to get rid of it, whatever. I kept it. Um, and, and I literally felt the anxiety and the tension stuff that I had here go away. Could some of that be psycho, you know, somatic that, you know, or maybe, um, but I did feel it lift. And then there were two more investigations that was right before I moved back to New Jersey. And I had to beg off of both of them because they said, you shouldn't go right back out there after something like that. Oh, so yeah. I missed, I missed the silent movie theater in, in Hollywood. I think it was on a couple of the shows. I was supposed to go there. I couldn't go, yeah. but, but I, I'm, I am definitely more grounded, more guarded and more aware now. And then the other shaman in the group, uh, <clears throat> Pamela Dinkowitz, who's one of my friends on, on Facebook, uh, she'll still check me on and off all the time. And she says that it's so much different, my being grounded and protected compared to at that time. Do you have any grounding rituals before an investigation? Um, Just fast food. Uh, <laughs> I said fast, fast food. Well, yeah. Snickers. Yeah. No, uh, Energy is important. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, nothing specific, like ceremonious wise, like, you know, a ceremonial kind of a thing I do. We sometimes do the sage and, and, and lavender kind of, or Palo Santo um, afterwards. Um, a, a lot of times I think the same thing, you know, I have my, my cross on my, uh, my uh, St. Benedict cross on. And, but I think sometimes the same things that, that we believe give these things any kind of protective powers for us, it, it comes from the same place. And so if that's part of what you're carrying, yeah within your aura or yourself, your and intent. I, I sage every day, like seriously, like every day. You're not doing <laughs> dance. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, I, I'm a core reporter, so I do, I write down everything. And then when I go to transcribe, before I transcribe, for, for some reason, it's like my routine. I'll sage the room, <laughs> I said it all night, then, okay, now I'm ready to transcribe. It's just this routine that it's, I have. I like the smell of it and I like <laughs> the intent, all that stuff, but, but sometimes she doesn't tell me. Oh. Like, a couple of days ago, I came out of the shower and I walked into the bedroom and I could have swore I was an extra in backdraft. <laughs> <laughs> I went to go do some room, stuff. You talk about negative energy and you're stuck in that all day. I mean, gosh, you bring that home, it'd be like wearing a lead weight on your shoulder. So, I mean, I can yeah. see your sage would just like lift all that crap off of you that you've absorbed during the day. Right. Probably That's how I feel. Energy. And then I'm more calm. I don't know. It just yeah. relaxes me. I just feel more at peace. Yeah, but Ron should feel lucky. At least he had sage, you know, and you were saging him. My wife throws holy water at me because when like, <laughs> there's negative energy in our home, she thinks I'm possessed and she's got to throw holy water at me. Oh, my God. <laughs> I got to tell you this, this story. I was at St. Augustine this fall and there's a uh, the Tolomata Cemetery, I've, I've never been able to go into. It's only open one day a month. I've never been down there. It's supposed to be one of the most haunted cemeteries around. They were open for Blessing of the Souls Day, so I got to go. There was a priest there who gave the beautiful service. I've got it all on video. It's on my Brave Souls Paranormal page. I did a video of the cemetery. The cemetery felt beautifully peaceful to me. I did not pick up anything. But the priest started to go around doing the holy water. Now he is probably 20 feet from me and he 
does like that towards me, it lands right here. <laughs> <laughs> right there. And I was like, I must have really needed that for him to get me <laughs> that far away, dead square in the middle of the forehead. I was yeah. like, and it wasn't burning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In, fo in football, they call that a Hail Mary. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. it was, I was like, he could, it was fascinating. But anyway, yeah. um, Matt. Same question. Have you had an attachment? You said yes. Yeah, my wife and I uh, brought something home with us. Uh, sadly, well, I mean, not sadly, because we learned a lot from our experience. So, you know, again, we're a lot like Ron. We we learn a lot with yeah. what we do, and um, it was a learning experience because you know, as young investigators, uh, we were into provoking when we were younger because, you know that's what we were brought into Pro uh -huh. provocation was like one of the biggest things back in the day because they thought by doing that they would get activity and so at the end of the night um my wife had a, she had a bad experience we were investigating a restaurant and we were in the basement with a couple of other investigators and something brushed up against her hair and her hair went up in the air and she's like are there any cop, you know, she's sensible, she's logical, she tried to look around for cobwebs, like there any dust around or, you know, and there wasn't anything around her. And we looked around, we didn't see nothing. She's short. She would never hit the ceiling of anything, really. She's like, you know, nice, nice and short. So she wouldn't hit anything that tall. Yeah, and <laughs> so um, long story short, then she hears a growl in her ear. Yeah. And she was like, you guys hear that? Because she's the only one who heard it, of course. We didn't hear anything. And I got the recorder going the whole time. I said, we'll listen back on the recorder later. We'll see if we got it, you know? So we were waiting for the owners to come and block up the building. We were the last ones uh, to stay behind. Everybody went home. So now's a good chance. It's quiet. Let's listen back if we got the growl on the recorder. And uh, what we got the growl on the recorder we listened back and i couldn't believe we actually captured it and i was like wow i'm like this is interesting i said i can't believe you know we got it and i was worried for my wife because i didn't want anything negative attached to my wife so being the husband and caring person i was i was more worried about that so i was like trying to tell it like don't mm -hmm. mess with her i said don't you know, be aggressive with her. I said, you know, this is my wife. I was trying to let it know its boundaries and stuff. And then all of a sudden we saw like the hangers in the closet started moving by itself in the closet near us. And I was like, all right, something's going on here. And we didn't think anything of it at first. And then I got a like big red mark on my arm and it looked like something actually bit my arm. You could actually see teeth marks. And I had, you know, it looked like somebody took their mouth and just like went like that over my arm and a couple weeks later stuff started going on at home uh doors were opening and closing by themselves our cabinets were opening and closing um my wife was home alone a lot at night because i was a security guard working at night overnight and she would constantly call me up at work matt this is going on that's going on she thought i would be coming home early from work uh, and unexpectedly and she thought I was coming up the stairs and she saw a black figure walking up the stairs and uh you know it was bad it got bad for like two years two and years yeah before we started to just all right that's it you know we're investigators and we love researching but how do you help yourself out of your own situation yeah that's true. you know it's like we forget everything we know when it happens happening to us isn't that weird right. and it's yeah. like, what do I do it's like well if I was like telling someone else I know what to do but when it's happening to you you just it seems to forget all that yeah so what, what how did you resolve that I mean that's yeah we um I reached out to a lot of local other groups that maybe more were more experienced than we were at that kind of thing and we didn't really hear from anybody and we were like it's kind of odd how like other investigators claim they want to be like unity and you know work together and here you are reaching out to people and nobody's you know responding back so i said maybe we should reach out to psychic mediums or a medium that can you know perform a cleansing or you know perform a ritual that could you know get it out of here and i got in touch with um kim russo i don't know if you know oh, yeah uh the happy medium kim russo she does uh celebrity ghost stories and all that on tv this is before she became well known on tv 
she said to us, you know, I'm real busy filming right now, but I can get in touch with somebody who can get out there quicker to help you. And she got in touch with uh, Virginia Centrillo, who's actually with uh, the PPA in Pennsylvania with uh, Mark Hives. I don't know if you know them. And, um, you know, so basically her team came and helped us and she cleansed our home really thoroughly and taught us what to do in those situations. And we got a lot of knowledge on how to deal with attachments from that day forward from, from then. What, um, did they say what they thought it was, what the attachment was? Yeah, it was basically, um, a negative, uh, spirit from the restaurant. It was a bootlegger. Uh, during the time of prohibition, because in the restaurant, it was known for bootlegging uh, during the roaring 20s and 30s and stuff. And um, he was not a nice person in life. And um, we kind of felt that the, with the what the psychic medium was picking up on, it was more attached to her because it resembled uh, its lover at the time. And it was more trying to protect her and attack me because it didn't want me around her. And that's how that turned out. That's fascinating. That's terrifying. Two years, though. Yeah. Yeah. Two years. Yep. No, and some people I've heard, I've seen people comment before about good attachments. Uh, you know, as I've stated in this group before, there's no such thing as a good attachment. If it is feeding off of your bioenergetic energy, that that's not a good attachment. If it's... No getting its energy from you, it's draining your energy, it's not good. Whether it's a happy, nice spirit or not, you do not need it on you. Right, yeah. Lisa, how about you? Have you had, would you think yeah. you've had an attachment? Oh, no. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I, I, am, I am very firm with when I leave a property. Yeah. Um, you, um, with prayer before I get in the car and then I get in the car and I turn around and I tell them out <laughs> yeah. you're not coming home <laughs> and that's actually one of the reasons why I stopped doing investigations was one was um my cancer diagnosis yeah. and then two I had a young daughter and she's a 17 year old now and it was just it it, it wasn't worth the risk and unlike <laughs> Matt, Lourdes, and Ron, my husband is not investigating with me. Um, he, yeah, he, he's, he's a great guy, but he does not believe. And um, and, and it's just, yeah, no, I, I don't know how I would be able to explain that to him. So I make Let's sure that- take him on an investigation. <laughs> no, uh, you know, it's funny because um, when when I was diagnosed with breast cancer and I, ha and I went through my um, chemo, and I was sleeping in the guest bedroom because that was the one that got the coolest because chemo is horrible. And um, I believe his dad was outside the door and would pace up and down the hallway. And, um, and I never said anything to, to Dan about it. And so that was six years ago. And I guess about a year and a half ago, we, we were having some conversation and I, and I just say things to him like, like I say right here. And I'm like, oh yeah, you, you know, when your dad's visiting and he's just looking at me and he's like, what? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, he, when I, when I was in chemo, your dad came and he, he stands out the door and he was paced right down the um, breezeway and he's like, stop. <laughs> so but Philip, I did want to tell you, there is a question for Ron and Lourdes um, from Steve about um, saying, um, you guys get great stuff. What kind of ghost boxes do you use? <laughs> and I think Philip would like that question. <laughs> is that Steve Holte? It is. Yeah. Is it? Oh. Yeah, so, it's, so we, you know, we started out, um, I started out um, SB7, SB11, the standard ghost box at a Memorex hack radio. Um, you get what, you know, what you see on TV, what other people you work with use. Um, I got hooked on ITC from being at the Glen Tavern Inn in Santa Paula. I think Ghost Adventures went there in one of the seasons earlier on. And I was with uh, Debbie Constantino, uh, mm -hmm. rest in peace, and Chad Lindbergh from Fast and the Furious. And if he was on the, the other uh, with um, John Tenney. Yeah, yeah. John T. Yes, he was on Tenney, the show. Yeah. Yes. And so, and Chad was really good with, uh, with spirit stuff. So he, he was using an SB7. There was like 34 people sitting on the floor, on, on the third floor. And everybody introduced themselves and it was the last couple people and then the one guy i knew said his name 
And then Debbie said, hi, I'm Debbie. And then Chad goes, and my name's Chad. We all introduce ourselves. Maybe 30 seconds. And you hear, I know Chad. <laughs> I was like, well, what is that? And where do I get one? Uh, so that, so that got me hooked. That got me hooked on ITC. And um, then flash forward from, and you know, Philip, uh, I've talked a couple of times. I've had uh, ongoing conversations with Dr. Annabella Cardoso. Yes. Uh, she's from Spain. Bang. She's the first female diplomat to the country of Portugal. She is an ITC uh, royal, royal to me. She's royalty in ITC. She worked with Bocci, Sinkowski. Uh, she, she was around uh, Robin Foy from the Skull Experiment. She knows all those people. Um, she does fantastic work. She's on YouTube. If anybody wants to look her up, we can put the name in later. Yes. So actually, so and so her book swayed me into what we now do, which is, you mentioned earlier, direct radio voice, which is using... Uh, a short wave, or we've used long wave or medium wave, devoid of radio emissions, just an intermittent frequency, and not it's scanning. Really, it's yeah, no scanning, no sweeping, no vocals or phonetics, uh, allophones, nothing is used. It's just that, and um, and we've gotten direct responses out of it that were mind blowing, and it's a bigger thing in Europe. I think it never really caught on here because first of all, you never saw it on American TV, so the audiences yeah. here who are influenced won't do it um it's not instant gratification as much as a sweeping box because sometimes it's a grind we sat there for hours listening to yeah. and, it and is then all of a sudden white noise static it's it is yeah. constant white noise static but that's yeah. yeah it's a grind but when it yeah. produces i think in europe because the people there were, were trying to get funding for for research and centers to do research and so to them, if you introduce human vocals in any way, fragmentary or otherwise, once human vocals are a part of it, then for the people who are skeptical, who don't buy into it, then you give oh, given them, well, there's human vocals and you put them in there. Maybe uh -huh. you're pareidolia, maybe you're hearing from, yes. and if you learn how to do this stuff, you can you can discern between what what is actually authentically coming across a sweep and not at all rationally explained like bad words don't come across radio broadcast my name when i ask for it does not come across radio broadcast if my luck is that good i want to know when they're giving away cash hmm. right? and if anybody's interested you can actually watch an interview i did with uh mr robin foy thanks to ron yakovetti for connecting us we had we had a really great interview about great. uh robin foy and um you know that documentary and uh they actually established a new location they're gonna do another recreation of the skull experiment um they just wow. announced recently yes. they got the funding for it and everything so i can't wait to hear about where, that where are they doing that experiment where are they going to do it um now, isn't he which he's in spain also right spain. now too. yeah somewhere in spain yeah they're not they're not in spain. The skull experiment is please look it up it's absolutely fascinating yeah, it really is i it's wonder if you know, the stoics, they did not video of course the spirits told them not to use video cameras i wonder with right. newer technology and things if this experiment will have newer equipment that they're going to use different things i mean in the skull experiment they would put a wrapped unused roll of film camera film on the table and after the seance they would unroll it and there would be photos and autographs of einstein and i mean it was phenomenal Beautiful. Yeah. messages yeah. it was amazing Airports so would come into crazy. the room right the spirit team told them that not to use that because if you think of everything in the universe being energy yeah. light is an energy form and they said it would have stunted the, the quality of the, of the progress so and it, they they also i think in that documentary the afterlife investigations it's on youtube they also did have a, a little feature with marcello bacci in it as well so that all got us going into the direct radio section and then just to be um fair and to answer what we started with was so we've been just like direct radio doing sittings every week once at least if not more for over like a year and a half now documenting the same time the same day yeah yes. pretty much we switched it once when we had to but when we yep. can, yeah when we have to yeah and then i've talked to annabelle cordoso a couple times and we've bounced stuff off of her and um but because I'm an ITC enthusiast and I love trying, I'll try the apps, I'll try everything. Oh, yeah. Um, I had come, I'd come to know Holte Paranormal and Steve and Katie Holte and the stuff that they did. And so uh, I watched some of his stuff. I acquired one of his boxes. Flash forward, I have, I think, five or six boxes between what him and his wife makes. They're brilliant. They do great work. Yeah. And um, his work so, is impressive. 
Yeah. So that's when I do anything to do with ghost boxes and sweeping um, with frequencies or, or Katie makes something called an Orion talker that I have that uses the little allophones and the little fragments of sound doesn't have radio reception or a microphone or anything. Um, when I use the, anything like that, I use their stuff. They're, they're pretty much like our, our sole provider as far as that equipment goes. When, when, he, when I'm sorry, when he played that Thomas Edison clip on your podcast was insane. Yeah, yeah, he gets good stuff. Yeah, he's, yeah. Got a, he's got a good connection to spirit too. So is that to say which box, which spirit box is your favorite? Which to one? answer Steve's question. Oh, yeah, from earlier. Like, yeah. Which one's my favorite? Yeah. Um, I'll yeah, say... You know, the, people in, it, the spirit box each have a different personality. Yeah. I mean, I'll get cursed out like crazy on one Radio Shack hack. Yeah. And not on anything else, but this You're one right. every name in the under the sun. Yeah, this is one of my favorites here because the, the the audio quality of the speaker and the radio to rate it's an RCA is fantastic. It's, it's great, and his sweep circuit that he uses is so clean. It's uh, you don't the noise and the annoyance of that that people complain about sometimes. Uh, you don't it's not non factor. So when I use sweeping boxes, it's it's one of those. When we started doing direct radio. The first time we got responses that came out of the radio, just out of the white noise, no nothing. She hugged the radio. <laughs> I love that Aww. radio. Where is that radio it's anyway? Behind her. <laughs> she wants to hug it. I love that radio. I mean, oh my God. When we, at first we got EVPs. It wasn't direct radio voice. <clears throat> and I was telling Ron, Ron, I hear EVPs or whatever. And then Ron does a lot of reading. And then he found out by reading that at first, it can start out with EVPs. And I was like, okay, you know, and I was loving the radio, but when we got that first direct radio voice, I like, oh my God, <laughs> I love this radio. This is my favorite radio. It's yeah. like, it's amazing the stuff that you get. I mean, it's just, crazy. Just Mind as going. like three little quick examples. We were doing one night and it was like choppy interference. And on the recording, I said, it sounds like a helicopter. Less than two minutes later, while it's just mm, a voice came through and it goes, not a helicopter. <laughs> yep. So I don't know how anybody anywhere, including the spirit realm, was really hearing me. I'm, I'm, right. I'm creating a mechanical wave with my vocal cords. It only propagates so far. So if the dimensional space that's hearing us is somewhere nearby or whatever, I don't know how the vocal is getting to where they are. They can't be far because it wouldn't run that far. But that was a direct response. And then it was like two weeks ago, we, we set up here, we let it, um, this is all per Bella and Abella Cardoso's instructions too. Like she said, EVP would happen first. Yeah. Set it up like Bocce did too, let the connection bridge establish. So we let it run 20 minutes or so, quietly almost, just let them find the signal, same yeah. frequency, yeah. same night. So we get up to go to the kitchen over there just to grab something to drink and we're gonna sit back down. We got to the kitchen door and from the radio we heard, you're, you're leaving. leaving. Yeah. <laughs> so, we both were like, did it just say we're what? leaving? Yeah, we're leaving. I was like, oh, you have. <laughs> yeah, so, it's amazing. The same uh, communicator. Do you, have you established one that will work with you? Do you you know, know, it's funny. It's because we've been trying and so far we haven't established one. I feel like we have one, but we haven't been able to identify. One of the names that came through, that though, in, in some of the askings of that, um, was Will uh, said Bill O'Neill, which if anybody knows the ITC history, William O'Neill was who George yeah. Meek brought in yeah. the Spiricom project. We did get that. Some say it was fraudulent, some say it was not fraudulent. Yeah. Um, but the name came through nonetheless. It actually came so through. clear. It came through on, on, on Katie Holte's phonetic box. This is the one with just allophones and sound fragments. Doesn't have word banks, doesn't have radio reception. And it said Bill O'Neill. So and, clear. And we were like, what? Yeah. I like, then, the, I like the Roddy Piper one you had. A couple, a couple of days ago, I got uh, I got Roddy Piper, <laughs> who was a pro wrestler who passed away not what that long ago. What was the question? Who was I listening? said that I was using a new box. I was using I think I was using the show the home. I was using the the, the TR six hundred four the Retecus that is uh that Steve built for me, and um, I said this is good for anybody because I just started using it. Yeah, he said Roddy Piper, <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> the wrestlers are listening to it too. <laughs> <laughs> they're using it too <laughs> yeah and how many syllables is that i mean that's you know it's not one little bleep it's how many syllables did it connect to make those words right so, same voice across many sweeps because it was sweeping very quickly there was no radio bleed through 
And then one of the one of the things about the phenomenon that's so bizarre is that when you get these little even poetic like lyrical phrase things, the the first word that comes out is not only intelligible, but the word that follows it follows it, and the one that follows that connects to that one. And it, it, and Tony Rathman says this on our show all the time that there's a sequence to these words having an order and, and a complete thought or sentence coming together and making a sentence, making sense over relevant response, a bunch of sweeps, which is really theoretically astro- astronomical odds that yeah. that would, that and would you happen. You can't dismiss that stuff. You can't. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's, that's, that's where, in, you know, the problem lies, right. Is because we can't prove a hundred percent of where it is, where it's coming from. <clears throat> but you know, that there's, there's the faction that, that say that, they, that they're skeptics or skeptical. And, and uh, I, say, I say that that's not what they are. I think a skeptic, a skeptic is someone who, who looks for absolution and truth. Yeah, so when somebody doesn't believe the possibility, right. you know, a believer is different than a skeptic. <laughs> right. Also, the th- here the thing is, is that if, if they have a, an agenda or a notion that none of this stuff is real, the paranormal is not real, it doesn't exist, <clears throat> they're not a skeptic. By okay. definition, they're a believer. But they use the word skeptic because societally and sociologically, it has more of an educated kind of like, you know, businessy, you know, astute kind of yeah. connotation to it. But in actuality, if you think it's all BS and someone else thinks it's all real, you're both believers. It's just, just a different ideology. Mm-hmm. But it's it, you're a believer. A skeptic wants to know and revisit it. Do it again. Do it again. Talk to your peers. What do they get? And compare it to that. And do it again. And you keep going. That's scientific, not scientistic. And that's that's a key difference. I love Ron's analogies. <laughs> but that really is, that really is this thing because people shame, right? They try to shame you. Oh, well, science says, or, you know, science does not say that. Science either knows or it doesn't know and keeps trying to know. If science it's, once it's, said the earth was flat. So, I mean, you know, right. oh, yeah. changes with every new discovery. So we yeah. can't say it's not real. It just hasn't been discovered yet. I mean, that's yeah. the that's the thing. Rupert Sheldrake from uh, I think he was a biologist who was who was also one of the Society of Psychical Researchers who sat in on the skull experiment said that that uh, that science is a method of inquiry. It's not an ideology. Yes. So as soon as people go that what you're saying does not fit into what I believe or what I think, then then they're wrong because it it doesn't have to fit in. It just it is what it is, and you try to figure out why it is or how it is, but it doesn't mean it didn't happen. And that's where the extreme of believing in a di- in the in the, the different other paradigm. side of it is because they want to shut it down. You know, they shut it down. But you know, really, like where are the voices coming from? Yeah. They're coming from somewhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And their respond direct responses to my questions. Um, right. Yeah. I was on a team um, a while a long time ago, and they were all about the scientific method. The scientific method. I was like. Well, how do you learn anything if you're doing the same thing over and over again? Experiment, try different experiments. Right. It's like no. the only way you learn is, you know, by accident or by experimenting. I mean, but that's what you're telling them to do. That is the scientific method. Yeah. Experimentation, trying different things, being Love open. A new experiment. Something yeah. Right. Right. <clears throat> that's the difference. People say that it doesn't fit in. I don't believe in it. First of all, when people ask us, do you believe and go, I don't, it's not a belief system for me. For me, it's an empirical experience thing. It's not a belief system. I don't have beliefs in something. I have ideas of what I think, what I get is and how it may happen. I have theories and anecdotes. I don't know. I never say I know. Do you use but, a code word? Do you guys use a code word like I do with ITC? We, we have. have. Yeah. Yeah, we have. We don't do it all the time, but we have done it. I mainly use it on um, residential investigations because when, you know, if you're using the spirit box, if the light's on, they're going to come visit, you know, they may have nothing to do with the location. It's like, oh, they want to talk. They want to talk. So I use it to say, look, I only need what's in this house to communicate. All you other buddies and friends in the spirit world, you (laughs) understand what I'm saying? Step back for now. Use my code word. Let me know you're you're listening. And it's funny. They'll, They'll say it, but. (laughs) <laughs> Does the U.S. have a national emergency station because um, Ms. Cardoza uses their Spain's emergency frequency, Right. there's no broadcasting on it. It is only for national emergencies, so there are no voices coming. There's nothing. Does the U.S. have something like that? Um, I don't think so. To my knowledge, they, uh, they used to have emergency broadcast services on, on, on um, 
long wave or VLF, very low frequency. And I think now everything's on the upper register, like in the ultra high. Yeah. Um, they used to use VLF for submarine communication because of the, the size and length of the waves it was able to propagate through the water. Yeah. Um, so they would use it for that. When Konstantin Radove, 20 years dead, called Mark Macy in Colorado, yeah. he advised him to use VLF, with very low frequency. Um, we've actually been entertaining the possibility of getting like a whip antenna or something we could put outside um, to run VLF. But so what we did in the beginning with direct radio to get as close to that as we could, we bought the, the boom box, it's a world band radio, and we ran at around 200 kilohertz. So we were just north of what VLF would be considered, which is under 150 kilohertz uh, on an AM frequency. And we started with the EVPs, I guess it was getting audio support from the noise, but then it, be, it for a while, right? It was like, we would turn the radio on at 222 kilohertz and it was like picking up a phone. Like there was voices right there. Yeah. It's fascinating. Well, we're getting down to the, the witching hour. So um, well, thank you guys so much for saving me tonight um, and coming on. It's been fantastic. I knew when you said you could do it, it was going to be great. And Matt for jumping in. So uh, Lisa, where can people find you other than hauntedlibrarian.com? Uh, the haunted librarian.com and then every thursday night i have the haunted librarian show on midnight.fm at 9 p.m on the new um, paranormal station tim weisberg's midnight.fm and philip actually is going to be on tomorrow night at 9 p.m we're going to talk about his um gosh his once in a lifetime and um he, yeah, he was able to fin museum. yes <laughs> You were, he was able to um, convince someone who owned a supposed um, haunted property. It's, that, it's not haunted, she says. It's not, well, of course not. It's not haunted. Spanish um, hospital in St. Augustine. Yeah. Um, and he was able to convince her to let him in. That, that, that charm came through. <laughs> so we're, gonna, we're actually going to talk about that because um, he was able to find some things that was really great. So Thursday nights, 9 p.m. on midnight.fm. I also have a Patreon account, patreon.com, the Haunted Librarian, where that's where I keep my um, the archives of my show for two weeks up to a month for free. And so you can um, hear some of my past guests and then um, read my blog. I haven't blogged recently because I'm um, working. <laughs> but um an attorney um, specializing in family law yeah working a little bit and um but i've got actually some things in the work because i've got a um uh, i have a presentation coming up on ghost education 101 on urban legends and um kind of demystifying some urban legends you can see one of my black cats in the background and how the the truth is stranger than fiction mm -hmm. always I didn't get to the story about, I just read the story about the um, Roswell crash where a female um, military nurse was taken to the crash site and she came across the live alien who was female. Did you, have, did you read that, all that story? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, yeah, she was supposedly the only nurse that communicated with the uh, alleged survivor, only survivor of the UFO crash of Roswell that made everything famous. Um, but yeah, she was supposed to be the only eyewitness that ever spoke to any any of them. And what she learned from the alien was, we're we're doomed. They're gonna kill us. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah. where can people find you? Um, well, we can uh, go to uh, YouTube or Facebook. Look up Strange Oddities podcast. We're on every Thursday night, 8 p.m. Eastern time, live both on Facebook and YouTube. We're on multiple platforms, Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, also on KGR, uh, KGRA Radio, uh, DB.com. Uh, we rebroadcast every Friday, to, uh, no, sa sorry, Saturday mornings, 2 a.m. for the West Coast people. Um, so we're rebroadcasting re there. Um, and that's it. Uh, Phil would love to have you on Strange Oddities podcast in the future. It would be great. I'm strange and odd, so I'm happy <laughs> to be here. <laughs> yeah. And, and Lisa, we'd love to have you as well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and my favorite paranormal couple, where can people find you two? 
Give it to you. Go ahead, uh, baby. <laughs> so, so actually, we have uh, we're on Facebook. We have a we have a page called ITC the Invisible Art. Um, we have our own Ron Yacobetti and Lourdes Gonzalez Facebook pages, and ITC have, Voices. Uh, Entity Voices, yeah, that was also Entity Voices. Paranormal Evidence is a podcast that we co-host with Tony and Shree Rathman, Chris Allgood, and Audra Keeler, mm -hmm. um, where we have guests come on and present evidence they've captured, and we roundtable discussion uh, about it and, and theorize, and it's it's really fun. The guests are one after another, just really awesome, engaging people with some really good stuff. Yeah, it's it's really really amazing. Yeah, the, yeah, that was the laser grid the other night was really good. Yeah, right? in, including <laughs> Philip and Matt have both been on. Um, with some phenomenal evidence. So we love that, seeing the stuff that other people are, are catching. So that's Monday nights on, on uh, KGRA's network or the KGRA's Facebook page and YouTube page shows it. We have a Gagnac Paranormal YouTube channel and very soon, compliments of, of the very talented Mr. Matthew J. Haas in the bottom corner here. Um, we're going to have a Gagnac Paranormal webpage, which is long overdue. Um, uh -huh. So that will be up soon. Which is almost we'll have, finished. Oh, great. That's awesome. And hopefully we'll have Lisa on Entity Voices. Yes. Oh, thank you. Love to. I yeah. can talk. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> we like that. Yes. We're talking. That's a plus. And you mentioned, you mentioned we're normal. We all can talk. And we can talk all day long. That's the thing. She mentioned, uh, she mentioned Tim Weisberg before, too, who's also another extremely brilliant person who's mm. who's in the field of itc and paranormal research if people don't know him that's that's also someone they ought to look up yes he's he's um i don't know how he does it because he does spooky south coast on saturdays and then he has the um the midnight society from 10 p.m until midnight right now but it's usually 10 p.m to 1 a.m and then he's also a, a journalist and radio host for his day job and he's just he he's just so fascinating and um, I just love listening to him because <laughs> mm -hmm. he's just very soothing, uh, but he's, gosh, the knowledge, um, started out as a writer and researcher for a pair, very, a lot of paranormal shows. And, um, now he's in front of the camera. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, next, um, presentation with Ghost Education 101 is March 17th at nine o'clock. Lloyd Auerbach is going to be on. Good guest. And um, if you haven't seen, um, go to his um, Facebook page. There's a wonderful um, presentation he does on uh, mediumship, some mediums that he's worked with on paranormal cases and learn about the Moss Distillery in California, about the ghost Kate. It's, it just fascinates me. So anyway, thank you all for watching tonight. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you to the panelists for coming on. It's been great. And for right now, we're going to say, see you next time. Good night. Good night. Thank you.